Greetings everyone and welcome to Fear the Awakening with the Return of the Giant DLC. Now, for those who are new to the channel, you might not have heard me talking about this game before. This is a game that I did a first taste miniseries on many, many moons ago and fell in love with as a consequence of that miniseries. I have streamed the game numerous times, I have played it off camera a lot. This is a game that really won me over with its charm. But for those who might not be familiar with the game, it was released in 2015 by Muha Games and is probably best described as a turn-based strategy game with survival elements and a... to say it has been steeped in Slavic uh, myth and, and just general uh, mythologies from the, the various cultures uh, around uh, that sort of uh, geo, uh, geographical area, the, the sort of Scandinavian block, we've even got some British mythology in there, uh, really would be selling the game short. It is packed full of references to mythology. Now, we are set in the game after an apocalyptic event uh, that pretty much plunged the world into a century-long night that has only just been broken, but tentatively broken. We will play the role of a god guiding our people to try and possibly uncover what went wrong, or just to learn to survive in the new world. Uh, it combines a lot of turn-based strategy elements with role-playing elements, but I think the game, as with many games, will sell itself a little bit better by showing rather than me explaining. Now. As I mentioned, I am very used to the game, I have played it an awful lot, but because I'm, I'm sure there are many people for, for whom this game will be new, we will be going through the tutorial and I will do my best to explain a lot of what I'm doing and why, where I think it might not be obvious that you know this is the result of many, many playthroughs kind of culminating in experience that it's just like yeah that's a that's a bad choice that's a bad choice in this situation i will i will do my best to explain things but because i am familiar with the game please forgive me if i just rush past something not realizing that i should explain it and just ask me in the comments i will be happy to answer any questions now the first thing that we are faced with are the eight gods of the pantheon now when you first start the game not all of these will be unlocked you unlock them by playing the game the game kind of has a well, it's kind of got a roguelike element, uh, I, I hazard to use that term, but uh, where each time you play, once you die, that's it, you're gone. The, any characters that you get, if they die in an event, they're gone. They, this is unforgiving in that sense, but you can dial the uh, difficulty down as much as you want. You, it's very customizable. But uh, through each game, there is a meta progress. Every single run, uh, the world is procedurally generated. The, the events that you come across are going to be randomized. And so you'll probably play the game a lot. There is a lot of replayability in this game. And as you gain more experience, these bars fill up and then they unlock um, perks for the god that you played. Eventually you will unlock all five and then there'll be no more progress to be made with that god. But uh, I believe that after just unlocking the first perk on a god, you unlock another god in the pantheon and you can slowly work through them all. Some of them, I have completed them all. Horos, for example, Morena and Lada, I've completed them all, but uh, I haven't completed every single god, despite the amount of time that I've actually put into the game. And each god has a lot of uh, difference to them, especially in these traits, but uh, You've got a lot of option in this game on how to win, so the gods just kind of give you a bit of a guiding hand. Pick a god that will let that will align with your your chosen playstyle uh, is the best advice I could give you there. Now, as I would like to make a bit more progress within my own game, we're going to pick one of the gods that I haven't fully unlocked, and I quite like Monkosh. Thematically, I think Monkosh is pretty cool. So, Monkosh, the Earth Mother or Mother Earth, life, birth, and nature are your domain. You were once the supreme goddess, ruling alongside Perun, but now, now everything has changed. The darkness devoured your beloved Thea and tarnished all life. You kept a handful of chosen worshippers alive in the bosom of your power, but they are weakened, lost and scared. You must do all you can to restore balance and to keep your people alive. Now down here you get the options for each game, and the first one is your villager focus. Uh, just consider this the 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 general ratio of class 
uh, the types of classes of your human followers in your village. They will all be human to start with, unless you've unlocked uh, a certain um, feat. For example, here, Horos at level four, you get a Night Stalker in your in your village. Uh, but for us, uh, you've got three main classes: crafters, gatherers, and warriors. You will always have one of of each at least in the village, but the others might be might be highly focused. Now, normally, I would say warriors are the best option. Um, especially since a rebalance that that was um, done uh, at some point, which gave the warriors a little bit more tactical flexibility. But for this one, I think it's very thematic that we would have a lot of gatherers uh, with with a Mokosh village. Uh, furthermore, you can pick from a, a bunch of difficulties, or you can go into custom difficulty. Now, as I've said, I am quite um, familiar with the game. This um, is you know it, it's it's two hundred percent. Uh, score multiplier, so you could say it's roughly twice as difficult as as a normal game, but it does go a lot higher. Now, I'm not going to go over each of these settings individually because I would like to just get to the game. So, if you would like me to answer any questions on this, just pop a comment down below, and I'll be more than happy to go into detail on on how these are affecting it. But uh, just to give you a a rough idea, uh, although I've got saves on. I'm going to be playing Bronze Man, so there's not going to be any saves coming. I, I always feel compelled to explain why I leave saves on, because of the possibility that a crash might occur. Having saves means that I lose less footage than otherwise, um, but outside of that, the only times I'm going to be saving is when I actually uh, wrap up an episode, for example. Um, in terms of aggressiveness, the overall challenge difficulty, I've got, I've got the difficulty settings, you know, Kind of cranked up a little bit, but we're not going full bore because at the highest difficulty setting, you really need to know what you're doing, and you can't be as open to role play and to making mistakes just to illustrate what would happen with those mistakes. You you pretty much need to be bang on the nose and and making every single move count to its fullest to to survive the early game in the highest difficulty, much less actually complete. So 200% difficulty, I think, is fine. But with that. Let's jump into the game. It'll take a little bit of time, depending on the size of the world that you've made. But uh, we are going to be going through the tutorial, as I mentioned, and all of the voice acting is going to be active because whilst initially it did grate on me a tiny, tiny little bit, I actually warmed to it over time. And at this point, I actually find it quite, uh, quite lovely. And so it was said that if the pillars of the world shall fall, darkness will descend upon all that lives from the book of the dark man did not heed this warning the sacred cosmic tree burned to cinder and so the darkness came claiming all that was bright and living in fear when all hope was lost after a century without light the sun rose once more Thea awakened from her dark slumber, and you along with her. But Thea is not the world that once was. The Age of Darkness weakens, but it is far from over. Life took its shy roots, yet death will not release its grip easily. While the sun keeps some of the evil in check during the fleeting days, at night the creatures of darkness roam free and angry, unwilling to give up their dominion over the land. It is up to you to find a way to rebuild Thea, banish the darkness, and strengthen mankind. Thea is awakened. Welcome. No time to waste. You are a deity of the High Pantheon and you must help your worshippers survive the darkness. So what now, you ask? You are divine, yes, but you have little power, and so you will know the world through your people's eyes. Fair enough. This means sometimes you will encounter your own divine messengers, and maybe even face your own avatars. Weird, I know. Your first mission is to survive. Every critter is trying to make sure you stay down. So get food and craft better equipment to protect yourselves. You will guide your people to victory, either by sheer survival and progress, or by solving the Cosmic Tree's mystery. There we go. This is Theodore. 
the voice actor in this is pretty much just the one voice actor who narrates more or less everything. And uh, I, I, like I said, I really warm to it. Now, I'll understand if you were trying to stab yourself in the ear with a fork. This, the, the voice actor in this game has kind of got a Marmite effect. I'm going to acknowledge it. There are some people who love it. Some people who've grown to love it, like myself. And some people who honestly hate it. And if you're in that camp, you have my deepest sympathy. Truly, truly, I do understand. I'm not going to change it because I like it enough to keep it in. But I do understand. And I feel your pain. I feel it deep, deep, deep down in my heart. Perhaps like, like the lower, the sub-levels of my heart. I feel your pain. And I, I sympathize. Don't worry. It is particularly grating sometimes with Theodore. There are other characters where it's, it's much better. Uh, right. So, what's this? Who's talking to me? And what did you mean, looking through people's eyes? I am but a messenger. Theodore, you can call me. But let us focus on you. Thea is a broken land. The underworld is shut, and the undead roam the earth. And creatures of darkness that ruled for a century want you dead. That's not very nice of them. Okay, so I need to improve our village and people. So how do I get started? First... Go and explore your village. Check the inventory to see your stocks and set people to gather food and fuel, like wood. Without food, people will starve. And without fuel, they will not craft or even heal. So these are really important. Fair enough. Okay, gather food and fuel at the village. Anything else? Yes. Once you've visited your village, check out the people standing outside. The exploring party. Select your party and send them to me. I will wait for your people outside the village. I have marked your people's map with a big blue question mark. Hooray. So you will see where I am. Very useful. Oh, and if you ever forget what your current task is, just check out your logbook. All right, so check out my village and people first, then send them your way. Let's begin. Enter the minds and bodies of your worshippers and begin the adventure. There we go. We get one EXP point. Ah, now there's going to be a lot of things that we can explain in this game and you can rename almost everything. However, it's been a long time since I've gone through the tutorial. I don't know how much of it is going to explain. So I want to err on the side of caution and not over explain things only to have the tutorial then want to try and explain it as well. So we'll we'll be going through the tutorial um, rather quickly and then we'll we'll get to everything else as well. But first and foremost, I'm not actually going to do what the tutorial told me. I'm going to move my people back to my camp and I'm immediately going to put them in the camp and then we're going to uh, start off from there. So let's check out our colony. Now this is the only colony we're going to get. I'm going to answer that question straight away because it's always the one that gets asked. Can you expand more colonies? No. Thematically it wouldn't make sense anyway because although it looks bright right now and there are dawns and dusks and days and nights, law wise the long night has only just finished, and the only reason this one tiny little colony survived is because Mokosh was using what was left of her, you know, enormous amounts of power prior to the, the cataclysm to keep us safe. And so at this point, we can just tentatively start reaching out into the world because the sun has come back and has somewhat weakened the darkness. It would make no sense to try and set up a second village. That will be something we can do in Thea 2, which is not very far away right now. But to the renaming of course dapper Dell. could it be anything else no no it could not right now in terms of equipment i like to uh strip all of my characters of equipment first when we get in oh we've got some really good equipment actually uh when we get in and then re-equip everyone this will also give me a chance to go over a couple of things that i don't believe the tutorial is ever gonna mention we've actually got a really good setup there my goodness that's good uh, let's grab that off you, and I've also left a shield on something. There we go. Okay, so first and foremost, let's get people renamed. So we're going to go with Izzy here. Welcome to Dapadel, Izzy. We have got Rifsung. There we are. And we have got uh, Sarah. Very, very, uh, very strong, very well built Sarah there. Uh, we've got. Fizzell. Uh I'm, I'm going through the, the list in the order it was randomized. Uh, Kenneth. I like your dress, Kenneth. It looks lovely. Oh, also your apron. Also, I'm assuming those are carrots. Uh, I'm quite partial to carrots as it happens. 
we've got Manoeuvranger. Hmm. Uh, hmm. How? Uh, so, oh, right. It's not an N there. Ajna. Is that J a J? Or is it J? Or is it an E? I have no idea. Oh, I feel bad. I'm going to call you Manoeuvre for now. Until you let me know in the comments. Uh, next up, we've got Russell. Russell with two L's. We have then got Jason. And finally, last, but I assure you not least, we have got Obsidian Mist. Obsidian Mist, rather. There we go. Okay, so what we've got here are our different classes. We've got our crafters, our gatherers, two warriors, and we've got a hunter as well. Uh, I wasn't actually anticipating having a hunter with us. Now, a hunter is, in a rough way of describing them, they're, they're kind of a gatherer-warrior hybrid. There are other classes for humans that we can unlock further in the game, or that might just randomly join our colony. People will grow up, we, there are children in the colony, and they, they grow up, and, and time is very timey-wimey in this game, so don't expect it to take an X many years sort of thing. Also, we babies come from cabbage patches in this game. Don't ask questions. I've learned not to. Uh, in regards to classes, though, humans have quite a large uh, array of possible classes. Some of the other types of races, because this is kind of a dark fantasy setting, uh, mythological setting, you've got goblins, you've got orcs, you've got elves, um, dwarves, most of them don't have as much diversity as humans do. You might have, for example, a war orc warrior or an orc worker, you might have, um, I think elves really are just elves or dwarves. Um, no, that is dwarves are dwarves. Uh, beasts and demons are especially diverse. I think even more so than humans because there are so many different types of beasts that come under the beast category. But by and large, humans are the only ones who really have classes. And the classes dictate uh, a number of... Well, their propensity to have certain skills. And when they level up, their propensity to develop certain skills. Warriors, for example, will tend towards more um, martial skills, so strength, damage, that sort of stuff. Gatherers, for example, might tend towards gaining gathering skill. They might also get a bit of intelligence. Crafters will tend towards crafting. Also speech and willpower, and sort of like, you know, speech craft and diplom uh, diplomatic skills. Hunter, in addition to having animal kinship, also, you know, uh, gathering, that sort of stuff. Uh, all of these skills, they are, there are lots of skills. In fact, I'll quickly go into the filter and give you an idea of how many skills exist in the game. Now, not all of them uh, are actual skills. Some of them are like statuses. You've been poisoned or you're heavily sick. Um, but m most of them are actually skills. And uh, there isn't really a restriction on what class can get them, just that certain classes are more inclined to get them. When they level up, there is a very large chance that they'll level up one of their class-specific skills. Um, there is a small chance that they'll level up any skill that they currently already have. And that also includes if by chance you've given them an amulet that gives them a certain skill, then that skill might actually be leveled up as a consequence of them gaining a level and having had that, that skill with them at the time. And then when you take that amulet off, they don't stop having the skill. Their skill would drop. But they, from that point on, might also learn that skill. And then there's a tiny chance whenever someone levels up of getting any skill whatsoever. So you can end up with very, very diverse people. You could end up with a with a wolf that can talk, for example. If 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 the fates decree that there's going to be a wolf that can talk, who are we to to say that's weird when we're probably going to be fighting Baba Yagas here and there, hither and yon, and skeletons and and striegers. This is a wonderful game because of that. But because of that. Every character really matters. This is not a, uh, all, all my soldiers are statistically the same at, at certain levels of development. No, 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 no. Two characters of the same class at the same level can be vastly different depending on the way that they leveled up. And that can be really super important. I already talked enough about their classes now, but do understand that this game... People really matter, and it's one of the things I really love about them. Additionally, class will give people different abilities. For example, a warrior can wield a two-handed weapon. Uh, they can't... Uh, sword, rather. You can wield a two-handed sword and a shield. Any other class will have to wield that in two hands. It makes warriors particularly good, because they can be very dangerous and also quite tanky. Brilliant for a warrior, I hear you say. You are right. 
Uh, Izzy, though, I would like Izzy to have this because this gives armor. It doesn't give any shielding, which is a bit of a downer, but does give dexterity. Two dexterity, actually. Dexterity is one of the really nice stats in that your dexterity directly translates to stealth as well. You will have at least as much stealth as you've got dexterity, possibly more, because your stealth may have leveled up independently. Um, so I'm going to give you this leather jerkin, uh, which will give you an extra two dexterity, which makes you a very stealthy character, because stealth uh, will, will help in a number of things. Dexterity also, I believe, helps in certain hunting challenges. We'll get to the way challenges work. This is not an XCOM-style tactical game. This is more of a trading card kind of tactical game this is like um you play your, your cards to combat your enemy playing cards from their hand only the cards here are our characters and their stats are based on the equipment that we've given them it's actually really really awesome but it, it's kind of hard to, to describe without showing it so we'll give you a bow um it makes sense for a hunter um hmm is there anything else we particularly want to give you? I think we'll leave that for now and we'll come back to you. Now, our warrior over here, you've already got 10 damage. I wouldn't mind giving you a spear. Ooh, that's a good quality spear too. This would make you very dangerous because it gives you the piercing damage quality. There are three types of damage that you can do in a regular fight. You can just do normal damage, which is this. Or... If you have a weapon that changes your damage type, for example, this changes our damage type to piercing, it'll it'll act in a different way in the combat. Again, it'll be much easier to show than, than to describe, but that is quite a good weapon there. Now, how much weight can you carry? Not much more. So you're definitely not carrying that. As, well, actually, you can. Ooh, really? I could give my hunter this walloping great weapon? I mean, I wouldn't say no. That is fantastic. Our hunter is stupidly powerful. They've also innately got the ability to leech life. Wow. You have seen some crazy stuff, no doubt. Uh, right, okay. So our gatherers, again, these are mostly gatherers, but everyone needs to be some level of competent in fighting. So I'm going to try and pick the best gatherer in terms of their raw damage output. That would be you. So I'm going to give you a pretty solid weapon here. Four, well, it's a bad quality one, but it is, well, actually, this regular sword is a better weapon due to that being a bad quality weapon. Uh, I will give you this for shielding and armor, and that should be good enough for you. Uh, the next best one would be you, I would say. So, what weapons do I want to give you? Hand axe. They do pretty solid damage. Axes tend to do more raw damage. Swords do that damage, uh, less raw damage, but also tend to have like a shielding quality. And I, I, I assume that that's to reflect the ability to parry when you've got a sword. Now, that is a one hand weapon, but I don't have another shield to give you, unfortunately. In terms of our crafters, now, crafters are the most likely to stay home unless I know that I'm sending them somewhere where I want them to uh, use their speech skill. To, uh, to win the day. Hmm, that's a poison to mace. Sure, I'll give you a poison to mace. And you've got 13 will. How much have you got? Hmm, you're already p capable of poisoning. Wow, that's... Actually, we've got a really good setup here. This is crazy. Uh, I'm, I'm genuinely shocked. I'll just turn off equipment that has been equipped, so I'm not constantly seeing that. Uh, in terms of damage, I mean, I could give you this... Sure, I'll give you a, uh, a blunt of great sword. It's not exactly the best weapon, I, I grant you. I'll give you an ivory short sword. And I'll give you a wooden sword. Now, in terms of armor, I generally prefer to give armor to my warriors. And you can certainly carry a fair bit more. Not quite up to that level, but uh, you can have that. And can you... Yes, you can easily afford to carry. Okay, not bad. We've equipped... All of our people. Excellent. Uh, we are going to go straight out to the tutorial, though. As I mentioned, I'm not sure how much the tutorial is going to try and teach us. But there are a few things I want to do before I pass the first turn. One of them is research. We've got one research point. Now, to give you an idea, all of these are the resources in the game that we can craft from. Because as I mentioned, this is a bit of a survival game. There's a lot of crafting involved as well. And we need to research them before we can discover them. Not before we can handle them. We could find them. 
in, in certain other ways and uh, perhaps by uh, breaking down other gear and then we could craft with them but we wouldn't be able to go out into the world and naturally harvest them ourselves so i do like using the first points just to unlock some better resources now Actually, before we do that, let me check. I'm going to turn this on and see what resources are around us. Now, one of the qualities that Morkosh has at the level that I've unlocked it is that we are guaranteed to start with an extra food resource within the harvestable range of my town. Unfortunately, it's grain, which is not the best one because it means I am going to have to research it to be able to use it at all. But it is good to have two different types of resources. I don't think grain plus vegetables actually makes anything, though. Um, so it's it's not the best one, and I might forego unlocking that. You can unlock constructions for the town to make the town just function better. And um, the constructions, what you make them out of, really impacts it. It doesn't just make them do their job better, but if you make, for example, something out of gold, you'll innately have an attraction to dwarves. Dwarves might just want to join your town and work with you. Uh, if you make it out of elven wood, elves might want to join your town. Make it out of obsidian, goblins might want to join it. Um, we can make various items, food, rings, all sorts of glorious things here. Everything is good. But I guess for now, we are actually going to go just for a resource then. Uh, I'm going to go for Elven Wood. Now, when you unlock a resource, you'll get some of that resource, five units guaranteed, and it'll show you where some of that resource is in the world. You'll simply know where it is. It might be far away, it might be close. I think it'll always pick the closest one to you, though. Wow, that is actually close, but it is across a river. Oh, no, we'll be able to cross that river. No, that's fine. That's actually really, really, really good. I like it. Brilliant. We lucked, we lucked in there. That isn't far away, so we can grab that and we can use it for crafting. So we've spent our, our resource point. Now, there's one or two more things that we can do. We can set up people to gather stuff. We can set up people to craft things, and we are going to want to do that. We can also set up people to construct. Now... We're not going to do any of these until we've uh, progressed with the tutorial a little bit more. Um, but there is another thing that we really do want to be aware of. Whenever you get a new resource, you can make use of that resource. This is true of your expeditions as much as your town. Elverwood, being wood, can be used to burn thing, uh, to burn just as regular fuel. Do not use it for regular fuel. That would be such a waste. Disable that. Disable any resource that you don't have a way of getting yourself is my rule of thumb. But we're going to have to leave meat turned on because we don't, we aren't gathering any food right now, and it would take us at least a turn to gather food. So we'll leave that turned on, um, but we will be turning that off in a little bit. Now, um, in terms of food items allowed for consumption, the, the more varied someone's diet is, the better it is for them. And this is reflected down here. If we eat lots of different, or rather have lots of different food available to us per turn to eat, then we'll start gaining bonuses for everyone in the village. And that's also true of expeditions. The whole expedition would gain those bonuses. But on the note of expeditions, let's set up our expedition. Now, Izzy, being a hunter, you're going out. Ripsung, I'm going to send you as well. Um, actually, no. We're going to send Saro with that fantastic spear. Uh, now, in terms of our um, gatherers... I would like the gatherers who've got the best combat to go. And I'm going to say I do want two gatherers to head out. We'll take four people out and leave five people behind. Crafters, by and large, aren't as useful out in an expedition party unless you know you're going to be doing some diplomacy. Once you've got enough people that you can spare having someone there just in case, it's worth doing. But initially, they're going to be best served in the town but gatherers are especially useful out and about because you do want to send out expedition parties to gather materials and warriors are useful out there just because you know you're gonna get into fights likewise don't ever completely abandon your village because the fights can come to you they might they might just go straight around your expedition party and just hit your village so don't leave it without some you know convincing strength there but generally speaking your village is the most safe place so you don't necessarily need to leave uh, as large of a group there. Uh, we're only going to take a little bit of wood. Every turn you use one piece of fuel to make a fire. The amount of food you use though is based on the amount of people you're sending. So let's not take too much. I think we're sending, was it four or five? Let's send 12. That'll give us three turns worth because you use one unit of food each. Your overall um, capacity in the expedition is based on the strength 
and the the excess carrying capacity of everyone in the expedition so we're taking about one third well a little bit less than that uh sorry a, a little bit more than that of our um weight capacity out with us uh create the expedition and yes we have got our inventory includes inv uh, children uh they age in a very very timey wimey way don't worry about it too much uh right okay so let's head on to theodore's tutorial area oh we've already found some people over there Ooh, it looks like a witch uh yeah a witch with five hulking rats mm, not exactly the sort of battle but we may actually get an opportunity to display some of the social battles in a moment but we'll get to that in a second so you'll notice we've got movement points up here uh the days of food day, days of fuel the our overall weight the amount of people in the expedition we've also called it an expedition one no that's going to be bad bad omen let's give it a proper name you shall be a voyager there we go right let's talk with theodore, theodore welcomes you thank you theodore well hello there I see you're finding your feet and making first steps into the world. Trying to. Well done. So, what now? Events such as meeting me will occur throughout your adventures. Sometimes they are random, sometimes predestined, and always varied. Events can occur when you're out exploring, but also globally, or within your village. So remember, leaving your settlement unattended may be dangerous. Oh, there we are. Uh, like I said, I'm not sure how much of this stuff the tutorial is going to go over, but a little bit of overlap there. Right, events can occur at any time, both within the village and in the outside world. Anything else? Many events will ask you to bring stuff or do things in order to move to the next stage. Not all of them have I multiple asked stages. before to gather food and fuel in your village. So, you can gather resources in your village, but also by setting up a camp when you're out exploring. To set up camp, stand on an empty hex and choose the tent icon from the mini HUD. Very well. Right. We can gather by setting up camps in the world. Got it. Good. Now events can lead to conversations or just random disasters. You know. But they can also lead to challenges. Just random disasters. To show you what I mean, track down a pack of boars nearby, marked by a blue question mark, and bring me back their bones. Look, well, the grim there, Theodore, but all right. All right, point me in the direction of these boars. We gained one research point and one EXP. Now, the way that you gain EXP and research is once the bar is full, then you'll get one new research point. Once this bar is full, everyone you have will level up. Everyone. And they will level up with, a, as I mentioned, the propensity towards certain skills based on their class. And they'll either go up by one or it'll go up by two on that particular skill but it is completely random so you can have massive amounts of divergence between people of the same level and same class it's actually really really cool uh later on you'll get become very attached to certain certain villagers be, just because they'll be that useful now we've got our packer balls down here so let's go and check this out and we will ooh, it'll take us a, a little bit of time all right then uh let's move down here we'll do a little bit of scouting on our way have we uncovered anything useful ooh, got some veggies over there Got some meat down here, very nice. Two places where we can gather resources as well. But we're gonna pass the turn here, and we're out of the way of the witch, so she probably shouldn't bother us. It's it's very early morning, and enemies are gonna be less aggressive, less likely to to focus on us. But I have turned that aggression up in the in the difficulty of the game, so you know it will have you find the boars Theodore told you about. There is only a couple, so it should not be too hard. However, instead of a straight fight, you can try to do a proper hunt. If you have the right skills, that is. Or better yet, you can go all native on these beasties and wrestle them to the ground. Not an easy option, that one. Okay. Now, first and foremost, uh, the skulls indicate the difficulty of the challenge. Uh, one skull obviously being a lot easier, a two, three, four, five glowing orange, so on and so forth. Um, now, these are different sorts of fights. And I'm fairly certain the tutorial is going to cover one of the most important differences between just a straight up fight and a a, um, a different option but uh, understand that when it says physical it means that the the combat will take the form of you physically exerting your characters you'll be fighting in the deck card game the concept 
of strength, of physical exertion. Likewise, you might have an intelligence battle. You'll be fighting the concept of intelligence. And different stats and different skills will, will work in different ways depending on the type of challenge. We're going to go with the hunting challenge, though. Blue does not denote the best option. It just denotes an option that is dependent on what you brought to the, to the encounter. Because we have a hunter with us, or, or rather lots of people with high gathering skill, we can go on the hunting option. If we hadn't have done that, then it would only be these two that we could pick. Often, by having these unlocked, we will get an easier time of it, but not always. Like I said, it's not always the best option, it's just an alternate option. So we'll go with right. the hunt. You have the right skill, in this case gathering, to enter into an alternate challenge. In non-fight challenges, the wounds you get during the challenge do not carry over after it finishes, meaning you have less of a risk of dying. Less, but not no risk. Now, when it talks about wounds there, in a straight fight, if your card gets damaged in the fight, then that's that's actual damage to your person. And if someone is badly wounded enough, they stand a small chance or a large chance of dying every turn until they've healed up beyond that danger threshold. Uh, the, the percentage chance of them dying is mitigated if you've got a healer by how good the healer is. But in these kinds of non-fight challenges, as it mentioned, if we win... Any damage that was done to our characters doesn't count. Um, so, for example, if, if you're in a, an intelligence cha challenge, the damage that is done to your character is more... Uh, it's the concept of intelligence. So, so they were confused, uh, but that doesn't result in them you know, bursting open in wounds. But if you lose the challenge, then even non-fight challenges can kill you. Because quite often, for example, if you're in, a, a, in an intelligence challenge to, I don't know pick a path through a burning building without getting caught on fire and you fail that challenge well the results are probably not good for you but let's jump into the hunt and i will show you how fighting works now this is an important part here we're going to be facing two hunting challenge cards and here our gathering skill is our, our offensive uh, the, the way that we do damage in this particular um challenge and our defense is our health just our raw health now, tactical, uh, there's two types of, of units that you're going to be able to deploy in these challenges. The direct ones who are just more or less, you're straight up, they will try to do damage to the enemy and try to soak damage without dying from the enemy. Tactical, they can join the fight as, as, a, as a combatant or they can kind of from the sidelines help guide the battle through applying tactics. Uh, weapon effects... Light steps, um, this card uh, is, is basically piercing. Um, backstab is the, the poison effect for this particular challenge. And distraction is the life leech effect for this particular challenge. Don't worry if that's a bit confusing right now. It'll become more clear with time. Okay, the opponent is going first. They get to play one of their cards. Now that we're in a fight, it's going to be a little easier to show you. This is the direct part of our deck, and this is the tactical part of our deck. In the difficulty options, you can set it so that you could, at the beginning of the game, when the deck is shuffled, so all of our players are shuffled into, the, into, our, into our deck, you can choose to reshuffle, to accepting certain penalties. You might have a free reshuffle, or you might have to pay for the reshuffle, it, by taking some malice in some way, but I've turned off reshuffling. I I prefer the challenge of just trying to do the best with the ra the way the dice is rolled. Now, as I mentioned, direct cards can just be played, and then they attack. The battle is bro broken down into two phases, and then the decks are reshuffled, and then you enter the battle again. The first part of of a um, of a combat is people pop down the, your cards in order. Uh, you might be able to deploy more than one card, depending on how many were in your deck, but usually it'll be one or two. If you deploy a card from your direct deck, they're just there. They will fight straight away. Tactical deck, they have special abilities, or you can, if they've got a, a, a means to do damage in this particular challenge, you can choose Get Closer, and then they will be applied into the main combat area. But they will start confused, which means they they skip the first town. Uh, first turn. Battles are, are, are split into two phases, each of them split into two rounds. Um, so the pre-round part is we, we play our cards in the order we want to play them. Now, this is going to do four damage. I could put down someone who's got enough health to soak that damage twice. 
And I think I will. It's only got five health. So either of these cards, if they attack it, will just outright kill it. So Svizzle, you get played. Now, what are they going to do? They have chosen to play their card. Those question marks mean it starts the round confused. So the first round, it'll only play through the cards that can actually fight. So in this case, I'm going to play Russell. And I'll uh, explain why I placed down Svizzle ahead of Russell in a moment. Uh, and now at this point, I can continue playing down my cards. I had the numbers advantage, and, you know, it's actually quite a large advantage. Now, our hunter has a load of things they can do because their skills are particularly useful in this challenge. Our warrior, not particularly useful. It could have played counter offense, wouldn't have helped. The numbers that we see here, your skill numbers in a tactics deck, are, uh, tell you how high a level of enemy card or ally card this ability can be used on. For example, this counter offense couldn't have been applied to either of these cards because they're both above level one. Um, I'm going to use first action here, though, to push Russell to the front of the queue. And boom, there we go. So Russell is now at the beginning. Combat will move from left to right. I will also then tell um, Sara to just get into the fight. That's the only useful thing I can do. But you will start confused. Now, Russell will attack. Wiping out the first one. Svil will do some damage. Now, Russell's going to do a little bit extra damage here because Russell had the poison ability for that challenge. Balls like a pro and caught them unaware. Your loot may not be as plentiful as a straight fight, but you did not risk getting wounds. Hooray. So your people will not have the danger of dying now. Super hooray. We got some leather, bones, and meat. Now, in this particular instance, I think we got more or less as good a loot as we would have gotten if we just had a straight fight. But that is usually the case. A straight fight will get you better loot than if you outsmart or use tactics or some other um, option which prevented you from being exposed to the, the real threat of being wounded. In that particular battle, we didn't really see anyone particularly badly wounded. But you could sometimes see someone, even though you win the, the combat, some of your cards got massively wounded in health. And if those wounds carry you over because it was just a straight fight, then they could still end up dying, even though you won. But do be aware that in the, the non-fight challenges, if you lose, you can still end up um, being wounded. Uh, we'll, we'll take this. Generally speaking, if you were able to do the challenge because of a particularly um, rare set of skills or it's particularly thematic, then you might just get better loot. Uh, sorry, equal loot or even better loot sometimes. But usually, if you're going for loot and you know there's no chance of them really posing a threat, go for just a straight-up fight. So there we go. Now we're going to have to head back to Theodore. Uh, there we are. But as with the, the car battle, I, I didn't actually remember to explain uh, the reason why I was moving Russell around prior to doing so. Um... Is because if Russell was at the beginning, poison damage doubles if you're attacking someone who is already wounded. So by having Russell at the beginning of the queue and knowing that Russell would kill the first enemy and thus my second card would then damage the second but not kill them meant that on the next round, Russell would get even more damage. Didn't need it, because it could have killed them anyway. But uh, it's, it's good to be in the habit of always trying to make the best ta uh, tactical plays that you can see. Right, let's go and have a chat with Theodore. Theodore welcomes you. Hello. Well, hello there. I see you're finding your feet and making first steps into the world. Indeed. Well done. We have the bones. Wonderful. Well done. And keep your resources. They may come in handy on a rainy day, you know. That's true. As you saw, you got both experience points and research points, on top of any material rewards. All of these will help you grow stronger. Hooray! And we got some veggies. Oh, okay, so we gain experience of research by doing such tasks. And we get rewards. So, now what? So, you've discovered that some events will let you solve a situation through more than combat. These non-combat challenges are often just as hard. But it means that fighting is not the only way. Remember... Wounds from combat challenges can kill your people even after the fight. So choosing a different path is often safer. And having a medic in your party will help decrease the chances of dying as well. Anyway, great job on the boars. Thank you very much, Theodore. Thanks, but the challenge was still very confusing. Can you run down some basic rules? We don't need that. Thanks, I think I'm getting the hang of things. 
Practice makes perfect, you know. True. So now that the bores are done for, let's practice one more challenge type. Social encounters. I spotted a fellow demon called Hurlick, and I want you to convince him to give you some gold. When you have it, bring it back here. Okay. Go and talk to Hulik and get him to give us some gold for you. Got it. There we are. Some uh, more EXP. Uh, but at this point, I think our characters would be better set heading back to the town. I think we've got one research point uh, towards our goal. We didn't actually get a research point for, for attacking the ball there. Typically, I find that research points only get given to you if you actually achieve some sort of uh, task in uh in your village actually on that note i haven't yet set up uh our gathering and that is very very bad of me our, our village has been idle right let's get kenneth you can go ahead and gather vegetables now kenneth, kenneth is generating 70 points towards the goal of gathering vegetables that's more than we need so kenneth will gather the vegetables in one turn and have a little bit of exp spill over which i believe will go towards the next group of vegetables however based on our difficulty options i can only ever get one pile of resources from each resource node we've got two resource nodes for for wood so we could get two um, bundles of wood every turn if we had enough people gathering but you can turn the resources t such that if you've got enough manpower on that node and you've got five spots you can just gather that many times worth of materials ideally but there's one other thing i want to note there's a large icon here and then four smaller ones that are designated helpers now the thing is with kenneth is kenneth has the highest um gathering ability i'll pop uh maneuver over over here and they'll go into the top spot and they're generating 60. however now well actually I'll, I'll move you down here now this is not going to give us 130 points this is only going to give us 100. now the reason for that is helpers only contribute half as much as the project lead but the project lead will always be the person with the most ability for that task so kenneth automatically got put in the top there which is very very useful um sure you can go up there and help out you'll contribute just five because you've got a gathering of one so you produce 10 points so we'll get some wood and some vegetables every single turn super useful now in crafting we can't make any gathering tools we can't make any crafting tools these are useful because it gives you more skill and even if someone didn't have any gathering before you could get skill through that we could make some clothes some straight up armor we've got some nice items lying around wow alternatively we could cook some meals that is also super useful unfortunately we were derpy and we didn't get any gathering done in the last turn because i'm i'm a fool uh, but we are heading back with some more stuff so i'm gonna pass the turn there and on the next turn, we should end up with a little bit. Ooh, we have got enemy spotted. Uh, that's uh, the encounter that we need to go to. We've also got people who don't have anything to do. Now, I could have had them gathering here, but it really wouldn't have made enough difference to make it worth my time. So let's uh, get you uh, the, the Voyager expedition over here. But I don't want to have them rejoin the Dapper Dell because then I just need to reform the expedition anyway. Up here, we've also got a readout telling us what we gathered. But what I would like is to trade with Zappadel. Now, at this point, I would like to bring our most talkiest of talky um, crafters. We'll bring Obsidian Mist because we're going for a social challenge. Uh, I'm going to drop off all of the um, food that we've got. In fact, actually, I'll drop off all of that and I'll take... Hmm, we've got five now. Let's take ten. That'll give us two turns worth of food and three turns worth of fuel. We'll drop all of the rest of the resources off as well. So that can be used in Dapatel. And that's good enough for us. Now, we've done that. We can still go into the village, though. And now we can actually work on crafting. Still can't make these items, which is a shame. But now that we've got meat... I mean, I could have just made some jerky by doing this. The way crafting works is the primary and secondary material contribute to the stats of the end uh, of, of the thing you're going to be making. It'll also change what you're going to be making. Um, with food, there are no particular stats. It's just food. The only thing that changes is how much food you're going to get back. Generally speaking, food that you've cooked will always be lighter per meal than the roaring 
ingredients involved in making it. But because meat is currently a resource that we're not generating ourselves, I wanted to hold out and get the vegetables so I could do this instead. So I'm, I'm only using half as much of my precious meat resources there. The catalyst has no effect on, on what you're making, or at least it doesn't in terms of food. In terms of crafting, the catalyst will affect... The more precious the catalyst, the better chance you're going to make something good, like an especially well-made whatever. Um, but we'll just make some bigos here, and we'll get eight uh, meals out of four meals worth of food. And it'll only each meal will only cost um, one weight unit, whereas vegetables cost two weight units each, and meat costs three weight units each. So we're actually compacting the amount of weight quite a lot with this particular meal. So carry on. Now we can tell them to make a certain amount. We can tell them to make all of the the resources that we have the um, all of the items that we have the resources to make, or we can say, just make it forever. And for this one, we want it made forever. We will make one per turn. Now, crafting and like gathering, you can overcraft. So in this case, we'll end up with an extra 14 EXP towards the next craft. Eventually, there'll come a point where we will make two meals in one day. And we will do that. As long as you've got the materials, you can make as many as you've got the manpower to make. But with our difficulty settings, that's not going to be the case for... Uh, our gathering, which is a little bit of a shame. Right, so with that done, let's grab our group and we'd best start making our way over to this area. Now, what kind of food options are around here? I mean, there's a little bit down there, but it's far enough out that we're probably going to end up being a little bit hungry, unfortunately, and it makes me sad. Uh, we've got one movement point. We could move into this tile if we wanted to. What is there? Yeah, there's nothing there for us to gather anyway, so we may as well. Sure. Okay. Uh, can we move over there? Yes, we can. So let's get in there. And now we're here, we can check out this location. Since it's on the way, we may as well. You stumble across some ruins of an old city, engulfed in mist and mystery. Okay. We don't have to do this. There are four unavailable options based on certain criteria that we, we don't meet. Could be the skills, could be the composition of our group. That is, we might need a certain race or something in here. Um, but we're going to search as a one you open star one difficulty buildings. or one skill a difficulty. strange looking stone and metal built affair. And you hear a clunking noise, then a blunt thud. Before you are able to do anything, you see a skeleton charging your way. Oh no! Two arms! Now this is going to be a combat and a straight up fight. There's four hulking rats and one skeleton. You know, there's a decent amount of them. Here, our damage is going to be our main means of doing, uh, of our main offensive skill. And our armor is our main defensive skill. Armor is the primary defense skill for fight challenges. It is a combination of health and equipment bonuses. Now that is really really important to note and um, because this will play into wounds later on uh tactical first action is is uh stealth counter offensive is traps and these are the skills that perform these roles support ally shield ally confuse and tactics down here the weapon effects that are in play blunt will do blunt damage and this will trample an opponent and that means if you overkill an opponent and there's another opponent behind them further in the queue and you've got damage left over that will be applied to the next enemy in the queue so it means that you can actually kill two people potentially in one go um piercing we'll cover that once we get to it poison uh as i said in in the last fight even though we weren't really poisoning we had an effect that took the effect of poison uh so, which was backstab Poison damage will double if you're applying it against an already wounded enemy. So it can actually be pretty cool. But do note that, for example, you might have 15 offense and 2 poison. Only the 2 poison will be doubled. So against a full health opponent, you'll do 17 points of damage. Against a wounded opponent, you'll do 19 points of damage. And then Leech will give us our ability to gain health back. Right, begin combat. Now, evenly matched, and we get the first turn. Fantastic. Absolutely wondrous. We can play one card in this turn. Now, we've got some people who could knock out enemy cards, but I would have to sacrifice taking the first turn, and that is way too useful. Now, our piercing weapon there, I'm not going to play you first. I'm going to leave that uh, in reserve. Instead, I'm going to get Obsidian Mist out first. Since Obsidian Mist is going to do a bit of damage, it's not ideal to have a Poison as the first card you play. But uh, on the second round, it'll actually come into its own. Uh, next up... 
Now, I can only play one card, but this one card could be quite potent. Hmm. Now, the way the piercing works, if I play a piercing card, the card won't go to the end of the queue like normal. If there's an enemy at the end of the queue, the rightmost card is an enemy, then your card will be inserted before them, and half of your piercing damage will be done immediately. It's the only way to do damage before the first round of the first phase has even begun. We're going to play Sara. Get in there, stab the skeleton, and now Obsidian Mist will get an extra poison damage. But they used a tactics card to make sure that uh, they went first. Those scallywags. Now, we can see that the general level of this card is two. That means that we could get rid of one of their cards if we want to. Might be worth doing. Might be worth doing. Hmm, but I would like to reserve this first action if I can. Uh, this is a tricky one, actually. It's a very tricky one. I'm going to play Siren up, because if I place down Svizzle and then use first action, anything you do will affect the rightmost card that is eligible to be affected by it. So if I can't choose to use first action on Obsidian Mist or Sara, if I play Svizzle, it'll be Svizzle that moves over there. Now, Svizzle would be able to take them out, but Svizzle has a shield, and I would like the shield on this side because enemies can only attack the first eligible target on either side. So, for example, this skeleton will hit Obsidian Mist. Once an enemy is played here, Obsidian Mist might attack this skeleton or them. But if the, f the last person in this row has a shield, then all enemies after them will have to break through their defense before they can hit anyone else. So, instead of playing Svizzle, because I know I want to make someone go first so that we can kill this skeleton before it gets a turn, I'm going to use first action on Sara and move Sara to the front of the queue. Now, they might have another Wrath that can use first action. No, they don't. Good. Very good. You already do enough damage. As it stands right now, we would kill everything without taking any damage. And that only does enough damage to wipe out Sara's shield. And that does not cause any health damage whatsoever. So, I'm actually thinking we're going to be very tactical here. We're going to use counter tactic. Now, I do want to stress, don't worry if you can't follow exactly what I'm doing. It'll come with watching me play a few more fights. Right now, you're having to absorb a lot of different mechanics in the game at once. But if I play this counter tactic, what counter tactic does is forces a random card from your opponent's tactics deck, and that's this side, indicated by the uh, the chess, the knight chess piece to be discarded straight away, as long as their level is equal to or less than the the, the level of our counter-tactic ability. Now, we don't know what level is there because the card is hidden, but I can infer from the other cards that are in play that it's not going to be level 4. So by doing this, I remove that card entirely. Now, the Hulking Rat was the, the one that was able to make the skeleton move first, so I took out their ability because you can't use your direct cards in any tactical capacity. So that's pretty good. Now, the way that this fight is going to plan out, we are going to apply 18 damage, kill you. We're going to apply 8 damage, going to kill you. You're going to apply 4 damage, potentially, to Obsidian Mist. You're going to take out Obsidian Mist's shield, but not do any health damage. Or, you're going to do it to Swizzle, and you won't even take out their shield. At which point, Swizzle will kill you. We then complete the first round, and then the second round happens. Once the second round happens, we start attacking their defenseless discarded cards. They don't get away, but we have to kill them before we win. If we can't kill them all, then we go into the second phase and the whole thing starts again, but with whatever cards are remaining and at whatever health they have remaining. Shields, however, get restored fully. That's why shields are so useful. It's like a recharging health buffer. So there we are. The thing I love about the, the tax in this game, it is like chess. There's no randomness. Well, there's randomness in that if your card or an enemy card has an option of attacking the either direction, they'll pick it random. Still intact. Oh, excellent. That was particularly good. We got lots. Oh, wow. We got gold, um, iron, some some um, grain, meat, leather. We also got a two-handed sword, an armored arm. If we right-click, we can see 
its stats specifically. Seven damage, five shielding, very nice. It weighs 135, though, and that is because of what it's made of. It's made of quartz and amber. If we wanted to dis um, dismantle it, we'd get a little bit of one of these back. But I think we'll actually take it. Take this stuff and leave this place. We got one research point and two EXP for that. Hooray! That was actually pretty bloody awesome. I like that quite a lot, actually. Quite a lot. Now, again, don't worry too much if you weren't able to follow that combat um, too closely. You'll get used to the way the combat plans out. But uh, as I was saying, other than the fact that a card could choose to attack the left or the right if both directions are uh, viable, and I generally, as a result, try to limit my card's options so I can control who they're going to attack, then you can see exactly how something is going to play out because there's no like dice rolling other than that one component. So it is a lot like chess in, in that sense. You, uh, you don't know what your opponent's going to do, but you know what will happen if they do anything you know a knight can only move in a certain way and it's nice sometimes sometimes i i, I like a little bit more uh, randomness but uh no I, I like being able to look and really think about these challenges so we'll pass this turn and just see how things go down Ooh, we're getting attacked ourselves that is unfortunate actually it means that we're going to have to fight the witch and the five hulking rat in a straight up fight. If the enemies attack you, they will always choose combat. If you attack them, I was hoping to be able to illustrate one cheesy way that we could get through this. But I'll tell you what the cheesy way was. Because we can talk, we could have engaged her in a social battle. She is the the witch is the only one out of that group that can speak. The five rats wouldn't be able to do any damage to us in a social battle because they can't talk. They can't present any arguments to confuddle us. The witch would be the only one able to fight back. And we'd have everyone in our party able to do it. That's why it's really, really cool to attack witches if you can yourself. Because you'll have the upper hand if you can instigate a social battle. But let's jump into the combat. Where I'm never going to want to resolve. Because generally speaking, that's a really bad idea. And it can sometimes go very, very poorly for you. Right then. Okay. Um, Izzy, this is actually kind of good. You're a very powerful card. I don't know what cards they're going to play, though. So, as a result, 13 damage. You know, we'll play play Izzy first. Let's see what the opponent does. Are you going to bring out the Witch? Yes, the Witch was in the deck. They got to bring out two cards. We're going to get to bring out two cards. Okay, not bad. It's a shame. Would have liked to have been able to attack you straight up. That is a shame. Now, you do a lot of damage. So what I want to do is I want to stop you from doing that. Now, as I mentioned, if a tactics card gets played into combat, it is confused. If something is confused, it skips the first round of combat. So, I've got two cards here. If I can eliminate this card, I can play... Um, oh, no, it's, it's counter tactic, not confused. Damn, I thought that was confused. Uh, okay, never mind, never mind. Rethinking, then. I could shield ally... That would be something I could do. Hmm. I could shield ally twice. Either way, someone is going to get hurt here. Uh, drag. Uh, we'll take out the rat, though. There we are. Half our piercing damage was enough to completely kill that rat. Then I am going to... Problem is, we're going to have a lot of enemy cards in play here. And that trample damage is going to be nasty. Ah, I should have played the shield early. And then put you down. Because then that would have meant that, as a result, a lot of this damage wouldn't have gotten through. Which is a shame. But it's a shame that we're going to have to live with. I'm actually just going to play both of my cards now my tactics cards into the fight and we'll just see how it goes we're going to win but uh depending on which way you go you're going to do an awful lot of damage or just a lot of damage an awful lot of damage it is yep ouch izzy might die izzy might die from that wound izzy is gonna trample the damage through there we won't get a kill but it won't matter there we go we win that but izzy is a death's door eight wounds Izzy has how much health? Probably only like 10 health at best if I view the group. Izzy has 11 hit points. So it's down to 3 out of out of 11 health. I 
think as long as you heal one turn, you'll be out of death door. I think if we can pull you up uh, over four, four or more hit points, you'll be all right. Now, the leech life helped out a little bit there because the ability to leech life from victims allows you to regenerate, uh, regain health equal to leech life. So we did draw back one point of health. Otherwise, we would have been a lot closer to death there. Not the worst of things. We've actually got some Dryad Wood. That is a fantastically high level resource. We've also got a Thorny Warhammer. A, a blunt weapon that does poison damage. Wow. Okay, that's actually not bad. No, come back! Yes, the Ugh. Uh, wow. Uh, okay, well, Izzy is at, at, at death's door, actually. Super bad times. We're going to find out if Izzy survives the first episode in the next episode. I really do hope you're enjoying the series. And those of you who are familiar with the game, I hope you're excited to see it coming back to the channel. And those who aren't familiar with the game, I hope you're liking what you're seeing so far. But until next time, and as always, do take care.